Hey, it's Chronologically Gaming, the only channel that's perpetually retro because we're playing every video game in order of release. The only show to include arcade, computer, console, and handheld all under the same roof. This year, we're starting 1982, and we've kicked off summer of 1982, just beginning in June, and the last game we played was the Arcade Machine on the Apple II. Let's press forward and see our next game. We're next on MS-DOS, and this is Asteroid Pilot. Let's see what Asteroid Pilot's all about. Another game that we don't have any artwork or box or information, so let's just pop in and play Asteroid Pilot. At some point in June, most likely the beginning of June, 1982 by R.A. Bauer. Here we go. Use the shift key to control a path through the asteroids. The object of the game is to reach the right side of the asteroids field. All right, so for this one, I'm going to let you see how this plays out because it generates itself whenever we're ready. And then we hold down the shift key whenever the game begins. Hello. Oh, there you go. And now it responds. And whenever you collide to an asteroid, then you die. So it builds the asteroids, which are all circles, and then whenever you're ready to play, all you have to do is hold down the shift key, and the line changes its trajectory. So every time I hold it down, it just makes it go up. Whenever you let go, it goes down. So all I'm doing is holding down one button to go up, and then I let go and it goes down. And you just go up and down. And if you make contact with one of the stars, oh, this hasn't happened before, it changes the trajectory. So I hit one of the cyan stars, and now it's... It's changing the way it loops. It's a little bit easier to control. Make it to the other side, and then hurrah! It goes to the next screen, generates a whole new field. Oh, this might look a little different or harder to get through. Let's see if we can make ourselves go through there. <laughs> I bet it does. It screams basic, right? Uh, it is generating a different play field every time, but it's a very literally basic game. Pretty simple. All you have to do is hold down shift, and then let go when you want to go down. And I'm just going to come right out and say it. This is essentially Flappy Bird in 1982. Th this is all I'm having to do is move myself around by holding down one button. And whenever you let go of the button, you drop. And whenever you tap the button, then you go up. So it's that's all I'm, that's all I'm pretty much doing as far as gameplay goes. Oh, there we go. When you get to the other side, nice. We get the full array of all the colors of CGA. Nice. <laughs> hey, hey, welcome. Just checking out the latest game you can play on your IBM PC. It's a pretty simple one, but it's 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 still a one button game. That's all you need to play. So it's, it's very, very simple, but it'd be a, a fun game to pass the time. It even added a little sound effects for the IBM. Nice touch. Let's see if we can make it through nice and easy. And there we go. <laughs> uh, it's not broke, that is correct. I, I'm with you there. I'd still say Asteroid Pilot is, it has the charm, the, it, it's not a lot of gameplay, but it has the charm of doing something kind of, kind of simple and working well. So I'm going to say of all the games we've played, I'm going to go two and a half stars. It is a subpar game, but it's not necessarily bad. It's a formula that we're going to see later on mobile phones, way in the future. But uh, back at this point, to uh, get this game to work on your IBM PC and to use this for an IBM PC, I mean, it wouldn't be the best. <laughs> yeah, not much to it, but uh, I'll still say two and a half stars for Asteroid Pilot. All right, and with that, let's press forward and see our next game. We're going to the Commodore VIC-20. This is Astro Blitz. Let's take a look at Astro Blitz, starting with the box. This one I'm not familiar with. This is by Creative Software, and the front of the box is pretty bare bones. Simple idea. It's a space shooter. It's all the it's all the rage. And then you can see we you just a joystick controller. If we flip it over on the back, this is by Tom Griner. As captain of a fast-moving rocket plane, your mission is to make the planet safe by destroying all dangerous objects on its surface and its atmosphere. Score as many points as possible, shooting down alien saucers, destroying gun towers, navigating your ship carefully to avoid being hit by enemy fire and strange alien objects. <laughs> yeah, it may have been in the magazine. I'm not sure which one if it was. All right, so for controls, you can use the joystick to move everything around. And then scoring shows you all the points you'll get for shooting everything up. What you do is you turn <laughs> how to play. Turn the VIC off. Yes, make sure you do that first. Put the cartridge in the slot. This is on cartridge. 
turn on the, the the game and then wait a few seconds for the display of center. Move the joystick to start the game. Move the joystick forward to start the game. And then you can enter your, your initials for high scores as well. Let's see what other artwork we have for Astro Blitz. Oh, nice. Seamus will be sh showing up later, I think, right? Th there's the cartridge we're going to pop in. An example of the screenshot. No manual that I can find for this one, but it is available in PAL or NTSC regions or Europe and uh, North America. Let's pop in the cartridge and play Astro Blitz by Tom Greiner of Creative Software in the beginning of June 1982. So when I first booted this up, I did not read the instructions on the box. And so I'm hitting keys on the keyboard. Enter F1 like we usually do with Commodore VIC-20. Nothing is responding. I tried everything. And then, of course, we saw in the back of the box, you have to take the joystick and move the joystick up. And that's all, that's all that responds. Nothing on the keyboard responds. Okay, so we are in. As I get acquainted to the, the landscape, this is a Defender clone. If you look at the very top of the screen, it's really tiny. But you, there is a radar. And there is tons of enemy fire. All those pixels are there to kill you. And there is different enemies that you can uh, reach on the, the screen. Like down at the bottom, there's some different turrets you can shoot. Here's a mine that blows up and the shrapnel can hit you and kill you. So if you look at the top of the screen, it shows you what is coming up. And that's how you can look ahead to, 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 know, it's, to know what to shoot. See, so I have another one here to fire. And a mine was part of it. There's the shrapnel. Got to watch out for that. But for the most part, I'm t paying attention to the top of the screen. The radar helps us out. Th this is a really well done Defender clone. There is no rescuing though. All it is is r run around and shoot everyone. So if you liked, liked Defender, but it was a little too complicated, too much rescuing involved, then Astro Blitz is for you. Because all you have to do is avoid fire and then shoot everything that moves. Really, really simple. Plays well on the Commodore VIC-20. I mean, look at how uh, smooth it is. To move left and right. And now the, the play field, though, I would say is a little bit limited. If you, if you see the top viewport of the radar, it's kind of constricting considering, you know, we don't have much uh, response time to avoid shots. Uh, worked okay there. All right, let's see if we can catch up with this guy running away. Okay, got him there. And there's another ship that can actually chase us. Yeah, it's running and sh shooting shots at us. There we go. Took him out. And it looks like we got just some towers there. Can't take out the buildings. Possibly because this is our home planet. Yeah, can't shoot them, but all the aliens take them out. Let's keep moving up to the other side. And I'm just checking the radar. You can see the buildings there. Coming into some aliens now. Another one's flying in fast. Oh, he's maneuvering. There we go. Got him. And it looks like we just have some drones that go around. So variety of enemies plays really, really well for a home computer release. It's, uh, I don't want to say a watered-down Defender, but it's it's doing something that Defender, uh, it's Defender-like, but it just plays so well, and it's a lot of fun to play. I mean, look at that. <laughs> Great presentation, too. Oh, 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 right, yeah. Don Maku game, you know, maybe very proto, if you want to call it that, for the brief sections. And here you can put your score in. Nice touch. Oh, wait, I can only, I only put it in one initial. I'm sure it'll let us do more. I just timed out like it was an arcade game. But this is a really fun title. If you have a VIC-20 at the time, this would be a great game to play. Oh, and if you run into the buildings, you die. Oh, my gosh. All right, so let's get to an area where it's a little bit clearer. There we go. So you can see we have tons of turrets. Look at that. All down, f shooting it all over the place. <laughs> the the way that you die is a very impressive fashion too. This is one that's working really well on the Commodore VIC-20. Well to its strengths at least. And it gives the impression that you're playing a shoot 'em up Moving left and right. Shooting everything. That, <laughs> don't run into the buildings though. You will die. When you do die though, you just pick up right where you left off. So fast pace. One of the best arcade games you can play on the... Big 20 or any home computer, I say this is an excellent, excellent title for the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? The lights on the outside, if you notice this flashing, the ship has lights that blink on and off. That's a nice touch, too. Really cool. Yeah. There you go. So that's Astro Blitz. I'd say of all the games you could play on a home computer, that is an excellent, excellent game. I'm going to go four stars. If you could go back to 1982, would this be an, a great, excellent game? 
one of the best games you can play on a home computer? Or is it just average? It's just the norm. I really enjoy it. All right, so Astro Blitz continues on like that. When you go to the next level, it changes a few things up. But for the most part, there's not any uh, thing larger or bigger like a, a Super Cobra or a Scramble that uh, it pushes you to go to the next level. But it's still, at, for, for what it offers, it's, it's great gameplay. All right, so after Astro Blitz... Let's go to our next one, which is the next issue of Atari Connection. But first, a message from... You mean you have an Atari video game system, but not Atari Missile Command? No, what, well, we you do, yeah. Defender. Great game. Or a challenge like Star Raiders. Wait, I don't think that's out yet. Yars Revenge. Oh yeah, we got Yars. You gotta have Berserk, right? And Atari Space Invaders, a classic. You don't? You don't? Come on. An Atari Come system on. without those games? <laughs> That's like having a stereo with no hit records. That's right. All right, so we're going to be checking out the latest issue of Atari Connection. So this one is uh, a, a title, or uh, this is a magazine that we've been reading on every now and then, but I got a, a new way we can check it out. So if you look at the magazine itself, we'll be able to flip through instead of what we used to do. Atari Connection, this is the Volume 2, Number 2, Summer Issue. Let's open it up and see what it's all about. Uh, table of contents, we're just going to breeze by them because we're pretty much going to be taking a look at the whole magazine. Over here on the left side is the interconnection section. This is getting to know who's new in the world of Atari or what's happening. They're bringing up Pascal as the new cool thing. So imagine a world where Pascal is something cool and amazing on the Atari. And then over here on the bottom right, we have the Atari 810, which is the uh, disk drive, five and a quarter floppy disk disk drive. It looks like it's going for, okay, you have different OSs to boot from, but uh, look at the suggested retail price. 50 bucks for ROM B, and then ROM C is 54 bucks. Wow. At least if you wanted to upgrade your Atari computer. This magazine does have some technical specs to it, or does some uh, coding and, and so forth. So if that's not your cup of tea, I totally understand. Wanted. Home photos of your computer. We need proof that people are actually buying the home computer. So take some photos. And then we have some seminar services if you need some help. Mostly technical stuff there. All right, so the next part is telecomputing with Dr. G or calling all computers. This is setting you up for the system that allows you to call in or, or use your computer to call in teleconnections. <laughs> oh, that's right. Wizardry was or parts of it were in Pascal. Yeah, so it's it's showing you how to uh, set up your computer to uh, for telecom services which is just bizarre. One of the reasons I read the Atari magazine or these kind of magazines is to be blown away that this is happening now. It, it, it's, it, it's crazy. And then we also have where you can shop by computer or a new uh, service that allows you to um, get your all the sources of software or hardware that you need, and you just call in and order what you need to. Nice touch. And then we also have some just question and answers. This one's someone asking, how do I use the collision registers? Showing you about the technical side of, the, of Atari with uh, memory locations, if you needed help with that, to build your own games. All right, so moving on to the next page. This one's kind of interesting. We just played Tutti Fruity on the Atari home computer, and it asked us in the options, do you want to play with GTI or GTIA or CTIA? And I said, what in the world is that? Well, here it is. It's the two different new graphics modes that are available on the Atari home computer. And there's an example of something they, they put together called the Farrah Fawcett. Don't, don't get too excited, but the uh, a program of the faucet showing the uh, different graphic sources. Oh, nice. CompuServe, yes. Is CompuServe already like live and going at this point in 1982? All right, so moving on next is the, uh, more graphics modes you can check out on the Atari. Graphics mode 9, 10, and 11. And then showing you if your computer has the chip or not. This is something you could type in to run and just see if it works on your Atari system. But I mean, think about it, uh, all the different things that'd be available for your Atari to, to make games or just to mess around with this, this would be tinkering and would be really fun to do in 1982. <laughs> oh yeah, CompuServe is alive. And then here's how you can get your GTIA chip on the Atari computer with another quick little code you can type in called Hypnosis that uh, lets you show off the graphics mode. I went back and played Tutti Frutti, seeing the different graphics mode, but I couldn't really tell that much of a difference, possibly because you need the screen as well that goes with the Atari. So here's the languages that you can currently use on your Atari. They got uh, Atari Pilot, Basic, Microsoft Basic, 
Tori Assembler Editor, the Macro Assembler, Extended Fig Fourth, and then the newest Atari Pascal, all at your fingertips. <laughs> no, it doesn't have Mode 7 or Blast Processing. It has lots of other video modes, and most computers did this. They had the text modes, and then they had different video or graphics modes, and Atari is no different. But uh, later on, man, they're going to be pushing and pushing computers to have lots of different graphics modes. We're still at the infancy, but I, I would say of all the games we've seen up to this point, 1982 and where we are in the summer is still right before the floodgates are open of all the games. So we're like at the cusp of before uh, it's just too many games. I know you think, oh, we, we were in May for a really long time playing lots of games in 1982, but this is still just the beginning of what's going to happen later when more people get their hands on computers and want to program. Mm. Oh, yeah, po a pilot's already uh, showing its face in, in magazines. And I think we've seen one example of Logo. All right, so this is a cool article. This is about the sound in the movie Tron, that they use the Atari computer to do some of the sound effects in Tron. And uh, they talk about uh, the person that was involved with the sound design in Tron, how he was using the Atari 800. It's um, uh, Frank Seraphine or Seraphine. And he's using an Atari 800 to do some of the sound effects in the Tron movie. Pretty cool. And showing off like, hey, uh, get the Atari and you can make sound effects just like Tron. To tell you the truth, though, I would say the biggest music system was the Atari ST that came uh, out much later. That one was the uh, using the industry for music much more than this. So it's it's still interesting that they're showing off that uh, they're using an Atari 800 to do some of the sound in Tron. Not that much, though. So just bear in mind, they're, they're, it's more of an advertising to try to get more people to buy the Atari. It's uh, it, it didn't do everything as far as sound effects in Tron. It's just had a little things, little things here and there. And then they even interview um, uh, Lauren Bassett uh, using his Atari and uh, how, how he uses it at his sound effects studio. And there's an example uh, or a picture right here on the bottom right of Lauren Bassett and Frank Seraphine. And after that, let's check out the new products in Atari. Oh, man, we already know about this one. We've already seen Pac-Man or the release on the Atari home computer, <laughs> at least this iteration. This is before the, the Pac-Man cartoon came out. I believe it's November 1982. But, man, oh, man, the, <laughs> it looks nothing like what you'd see or expect from Pac-Man. Looks like a, a strange hybrid. So, yeah, Pac-Man's coming out. Uh, get ready for that. You only need 16K of RAM to play it, and we have. It It rocks. There's another game coming out called My First Alphabet Educational, so we don't care about that. But then we have the file, Home Filing Manager, another software that we don't care about as well. Here on the channel, we're only focusing on the software of video games, mostly. The last episode when we played the arcade machine, that's kind of dipping our toes into half of a software and half into a video game. But if you're designing your own arcade games, I still consider that a video game. At this point, there's lots of applications and software out there that are very impressive and even some demos, but those are we're not really focusing on the channel. It's only the game section. We want to hear and see the games. So for more new products, they also have, uh, besides Home Filing Manager, the Macro Assembler and Program Text Editor, more software, don't care about that. But here's what's coming out very soon. Centipede, which we'll be seeing uh, shortly in June on the Atari home computer. We've seen plenty of variations and some poor variations, but we'll get the official one on Atari coming up uh, in the next few episodes. And then they have the... Uh, coast-to-coast -coast service for your Atari home computer. So now, if you call this number, there we go, you can get Atari service done on your system. Coast-to-coast. -coast. Nationwide. I bet they're not doing Hawaii and Alaska, though. All right, our next one is Atari computer camps. That's right. Who was subjected to or enjoyed Atari computer camps in the summer of 1982? It doesn't give us any details about the cost of this, but I'd be curious to know how much would it cost to send your kid away on Atari camps? We believe computers are a tool and they'll be used in the future. And yes, they will. Did you just get to play games the whole time or did you actually have to do code? Looks like campers are going to receive 12 hours of classroom instruction each week using popular Atari Pilot and Atari Basic. So they will be learning to program. And uh, it says here that there's going to be one instructor for five or six campers. So uh, almost like a classroom experience or a tutoring experience. But as a camp, no playing around in the canoe or checking out the what, how much physical exercise was happening at this camp. I don't think there was any. And then over on the right side, we have Pac-Man going to Switzerland. 
Uh, <laughs> I wonder if this was actually taken in Switzerland. Someone had to dress up in a Pac-Man costume and, and go on the slopes. Uh, hopefully it was only a photo shoot. No Pac-Man were harmed in the making of this picture. And then over here is a very interesting hooking up your Atari computer to a home photography kit. So I am curious to see how well this would work. Uh, but, but look at that. This is still the age where you went to develop your film and take pictures. So it's the earliest, I would say, of digital photography. Still blows my mind this exists. These magazines are starting to turn into the, I can't believe this is, I can't believe it's real in 1982. And over on the right side, this is Scott Schinderman, who is a early programmer. He is doing, I think, music. And yeah, it, it's just showing that we have kids that are getting into and programming for the Atari. Get your kids an Atari so they can program. And then over on here, they also do some things for kids as well. Like uh, this one's a program puzzle or a database. And it's all type in. Put it in your system, run it, see how, see how see what happens. And then over here is what they usually do with Atari Connection, where they have code, but there's problems with it. There's bugs. If you write down all the bugs and then send it in to Atari, then you can win some uh, some part of the contest. What are they giving away this time? Looks like a prize drawing for an Atari computer. Oh, you get to win Pac-Man. So if you know all the bugs here, you'd win Pac-Man. That's pretty cool. All right, and then next we have the last week's or last season's winner of Find the Bug showing the answers, what those kids found. Great job, kids. And then we have the Atari computer sound finder. Want to create blast off hyperspace from Star Raiders? So this is showing you how to do the sounds or recreate some of the sounds you've seen in other games. Really nice touch. And this would be a good find if you, again, were the computer nerd back in at this time, wanting to type these in and see the sounds that come out of your Atari. And that would be me. All right, and the next one is doing some fun stuff in Pilot. We were just talking about that in the chat. We have uh, Turtle Chase, a few things you can try. So this is, again, you're just typing them in and seeing what the results are. And this helps you kind of learn how to program for the system. Giving examples. We got Turtle Chase, 3D Generator, a, a few different ones to play, on, play around on your Atari computer. And then we have some updates on using Pilot and uh, what kind of different commands you can play around with on your Atari computer, as well as the colors, because that's pretty much what this was big about doing the colors uh, and, and showing off your Atari to other uh, other computers. Oh, they did the kind of the same thing too. Oh, nice. Sell them commercially. <laughs> yeah, very fitting. With the uh, uh, arcade uh, system that uh, Broderbund made, I'm, I'm wondering if they use that to send in or, or get people to send in programs so that, that you could make a, a a game and then Broderbun gets the gets the credit for it. Maybe someone did. And over here we have book reviews, which is fitting because the next games we're going to be playing are coming from a book and we haven't really hit on famous video game books. And what I mean by books is at this point people would publish books that had the code inside for games. So you would find a lot of games to type in from novels. And there's some big ones like Compute does some and magazine publications do them as well. Oh, that's right. Being proactive. maybe. Well, this is one of the reasons why um, the crash was mostly affecting console. Whenever the a crash in North America uh, started, it really didn't affect the computer market as well or as much. They just kept trucking along, possibly from the amount of programmers that were still wanting to make games or enjoyed making the games in the Atari. <laughs> yeah, well, we still have plenty of crap, though. Uh, you have to make crap before you make the better, the better games. And over here is a catalog of Atari swag. We got some pins, buckles, shirts. Oh, a Caverns of Mars shirt. I'd like to have that. That's nice. And then uh, Centipede down at the bottom one. Very cool. And there you go. So that is what we have for Atari coming out in the summer issue and what to expect moving forward. Atari Missile Command. That's what summer's going to look like, at least what it, Atari says. Let's press forward and see our next game. And we're now on the Atari home computer. Very fitting. I didn't put all this together. Trust me. This is Attack on the Death Star. This is one you would have found in a magazine, Antic Magazine. There's the cover of the June 1982 Antic or the Atari Resource Magazine. And then this is the code you would have had to type in for Attack on the Death Star. And this isn't all the code. It's like three pages worth. Yeah, that's right. Computer Market was doing fantastic. Oh, yeah. And the Coleco Atom, which we haven't seen yet, but we will. We will soon. 
<laughs> so there's even more computers that are going to be coming up and not just in the North American market. We're going to be seeing everything all over the world here on the channel. All right, so there is an example of the screenshot. After talking about what the Atari can do, let's see. Let's play some Attack on the Death Star by David and Plotkin and Maria Montez. The beginning of June, 1982. So this one is one that we're going to have to speed up a little bit. It's going to make the screen blank for a while. And then whenever it's ready, yes. So it does take a while to load. And this is, again, when, when you would type in, I am able to control this with the Atari VCS joystick. But whenever I fire, look how slow... <laughs> Oh gosh, he did hit me, but look how slow the shot takes to get to the end. If you want to control this, you have to think like you're playing in a plane. So when I move up on the, the, the joystick, it goes down, the cursor, uh, the, the crosser goes down. When I pull back, then it goes up. When I want to move left and right, it's actually going to move the enemies left and right, but the crosshair does not move left and right. Essentially, we're doing the trench run attack in Star Wars. But you can you can definitely see how it's more of a homebrew game. This is not a fully fleshed out one. It is cool for the perspective that we have. And it shows you how much people were dying to play a Star Wars game. But we didn't have anything officially released yet. There was only one that I can think of that was the uh, like Star Trek 3.5 that we saw by Adventure International. But everything else, it's this. Fan games that were made. <laughs> All right, that's a good point. That's what I'm talking about, Victor. The Coleco was the Connecticut Leather Company. Why didn't they put leather all over the Coleco Vision? We haven't seen it yet, by the way. There is no Coleco Vision. So no more spoilers. One of the hottest new consoles. We don't even know what it is. Everything we've seen on magazines so far has said that Coleco has games coming out, but not the console. We have seen, though, the preview of the Atari 5200, the Super System, coming out soon. There you go. So that's Attack on the Death Star. For a type-in game, it's okay. For a game we've seen of all the other games at this point, I'm going to say it's a bad title just because of the way it controls. It doesn't give you a full experience and a little too slow. So I'm going to go two stars for Attack on the Death Star. But then again, it, we're comparing everything on the computer game. For a type-in game, though, this would have been a few hours of fun. Well, a few hours to type it in and then a few hours of fun after that. All right, and with that, let's press forward and see our next game. Still on the Atari home computer, this is Backgammon. Not the Backgammon we've already seen on the Atari. This is a different Backgammon. This one is part of a book called Games for the Atari. And you can see over here on the far left side, this had Backgammon, Smarty, Bomber, Robot Attack, Ball. Had a few different ones you could type in. And these kind of books were popular at the time uh, to give you uh, a way to have lots of games for a cheap price. You could pay probably 2 or $3 for a book that has several games. But you're paying for it because you have to type in you know all the code. Here's the example of the advertisement flyer that this book would have came from. This is Hofacker. Make sure you pronounce that slowly and clearly. No slip-ups. And uh, here's what it had in the book about backgammon. Uh, this is what the, the, the page you would turn to after you typed in the code of how to play and how the game runs for backgammon. All right, so let's type in and play backgammon on our Atari home computer at the beginning of June 1982. By S. Roberts and Hans Christoph Wagner. I hope I'm typing that or saying that correctly. All right, so here we go. Press return to begin. We are in, and that looks like backgammon to me. Here's the big problem with this, this type in version of backgammon it's all type in. We've played plenty that use the controller and the joystick, but this is, is not using the VCS joystick. So, what do you want to play as red or blue? Let's play as red. You push the number, push enter, and then now what do you want to move from? So I think we can move, uh, what is that, uh, 13 to 18? Oh, I want to move 13 and then move 13 to 18? Oh, sorry, you can't move that way. 13 to 20 then? Oh, 13 to 19 then. Oh my gosh, see what I'm talking about. You Well, first of all, if you haven't played backgammon, you need to get your pieces from one side all the way around the end. Uh, so it's, it is a, a, a strategy game, but um, it's so rudimentary that, <laughs> yes, it is extremely fed up. It doesn't even want to run correctly, but it is backgammon. The only problem is the text interface. A text parser to type in the commands for backgammon is just poor. So I'd save all the games you could play. It's not even just it's not even just that, but it's how much do you want to play backgammon on a system? I'm going to go one and a half stars for backgammon. It isn't broken, but uh, it's pretty bad. 
And with that, let's press forward and see our next game. Here we go on the Timex Sinclair 1000. This is backgammon. Putting more backgammon in your life. Let's take a look at the box. Need 16K for this one. Open the whole thing up, and that would explain all the steps to play some backgammon on your Timex Sinclair. Back-to-back -back backgammon. I love it. An example of the screenshot. Here we go. Let's pop it and play some backgammon on the Timex Sinclair 1000. If you see the ZX81 there, it's because that would be the same exact, pretty much the exact same system, but in Europe. All right, so originally from Scion Computers, what skill level? Let's go four. Go big or go home. We want fast mode, not slow mode. So we're typing this in on the keyboard. Do we want to change anything? No, we're ready to play backgammon. So here you go. This one is almost we went from one computer to, to another. Even though the, the last one was typing, check out the, the, the presentation here. And this one, you're going to be moving yourself around using letters. So if it is our turn, oh, it looks like it's now our turn. We would do uh, M and then enter. And that's how you would move yourself around, typing in the letters and moving your pieces all the way around for backgammon. Again, another title we're not going to play very much, but uh, I would say even lower, I'm going to go one star for backgammon on the Timex. So it's, again, a title that not just if it was a good game of backgammon, how much would backgammon compare to all everything else we played on the home computer? <laughs> I know, right? We've seen plenty of bad box arts for computer, and this one is another one. Like, what, what are you trying to sell? It, it's just bare to the bare bones. Here it is, backgammon. You like backgammon? Buy it. That's, that's you don't even know anything else. They're not doing what Atari does. And if you look at the front box for their backgammon, it looks epic, like Othello. Have you seen the uh, box for Othello? Check that one out. It, it looks amazing. It makes you want to play Othello. All right, and with that, let's see our next game. We're back on the Atari home computer, and this is Ball, another title in the book Games for Atari. I did not include every title in the Games for Atari, just doing a few to give you the idea, but there it is for the reference. This is the, the book you would have used to play this game. So let's type it and play Ball by S. Roberts, the beginning of June, 1982. Don't forget, it's by Hofacker. <laughs> Say that two, three times fast. Okay, so here's the way this works. It goes right into the game. I am controlling a paddle. And you think to yourself, oh, it's like Pong. We're, we're playing some Pong. That's cool. No, it's not. This is scoring you every time that you make contact with the ball, you're getting a point. That's right. Ladies and gentlemen, this is regenerative. This is going back even older and worse than Pong because you're not even bouncing anything. You are literally just catching the ball and getting points for it. Terrible. Just terrible. So terrible, I'm going to give it the lowest rating we can. Since zero isn't even registered, I gotta get a half star. It is the worst thing I've ever seen for any game we've ever played. <laughs> oh yeah, it's worse than one. Well, it is just called ball, so what are you gonna do? All right, our next one is the final one for the games for the Atari, I believe, called Barrier. Let's take a look at Barrier, another one that you had to type in from this book, and let's pop in and play, or type in and play Barrier. Again, by S. Roberts, the beginning of June, 1982. Oh, gosh. Mommy, make it stop. <laughs> if you're not awake now, hopefully that uh, woke you up. <laughs> oh, gosh. Yeah, it's just so bad. Now, I'm doing this to give you another spectrum of everything else that's available out there because there wasn't just cartridges, discs, uh, cassette tapes. Uh, and there was also books that had things you could type in. And here's another example. So which graphic mode do we want? You can pick three, five, or seven. I'm gonna go with graphic mode three, just to show you how simple it could be. And then number of players, let's go two, uh, one player. This is a two player simultaneous game if you wanted to. Player one let's, is gonna be Chrono. And then we're in, waiting to play. I think this one loads, right? There you go. So here we go. We are playing a barrier, which is essentially a light cycle variant game. Same thing we've seen with surround barricade in the arcade since the seventies. And I'm playing against the computer. They're probably going to get the best of me. Yes. And the computer won. If we go back to, okay. So if we continue, it, it replaces the same game mode, but just to show you some of the game modes on the Atari, I'm going to switch it out to game mode seven or graphics mode seven. That way you can see that it's the exact same thing, but programmed in uh, different ways. No, make it stop. <laughs> All right, so let's pick uh, graphics mode seven. Number of barriers. This time let's do two barriers. 
And again, one player. I don't have another player with me, but you could play two player at the same time. And it's Chrono. There you go. So now we're in. If you look at the screen now, it looks drastically different, almost like we're zoomed way out from the last time we played. And you have so much more real estate to play on. But if you're familiar with Tron and the light cycle uh, uh, game that's, that you can play, it's the same idea. But here on... Uh, th this is more reminiscent of what we played originally in the 70s in the arcade. So it's all right for the time. For a typing game, though, it's pretty cool. I still say of all the games you could play, two-player simultaneous barrier is all right. Uh, I'm going to go uh, two and a half stars of all the games you could play. It's subpar. Yeah, and you can switch between the different uh, graphics modes. Pretty cool. All right, so after a barrier, let's see what our next game is. We're now on the Apple II, and this is Beagle Bag. Let's see what Beagle Bag's all about with the box first. <laughs> Looks like we're buying dog food, actually. This is by Bert, Bert Kersey and the Beagle Brothers staff. This one is 12 of games that they had made previously. I am not familiar where or how the previous games were, if they were type-in games or if they were commercially released. So, to make sure we cover all the games, here is all of them in the compilation. On the Beagle Bag, there's the example of the five and a quarter floppy disk we're going to pop in. Twelve games on one disk. So it's a compilation, and I'm a little skeptical. We've seen compilations go south, uh, particularly in Europe. All right, so let's pop it and play Beagle Bag by the Beagle Brothers. The beginning of June, 1982. So there we go. There's all 12 of the games. We are not going to play all 12. I'm going to highlight some of the, the ones that are interesting. This one is Subsearch. Now, this allows you to go back and forth between the games, which is kind of nice. We'll play a little bit of sub search and see what it's like, starting with finding enemy subs. And it's more of a hide or uh, move yourself around the maze kind of thing. So you can see I use the keyboard to move myself around. It's giving me the commands down the bottom. And you're just searching for other subs. And if you want, you can th use a scanner and you can even use Q to take them out. Uses. Oh, it fills up your fuel there, I see. So let's go east and west, there we go. So it's more of a, like a hide and seek style game. Kind of simple still, but uh, the, the, the premise is something we've seen before. All right, so let's go back to the main menu and we'll just get a whole sample of a few of the games in the Beagle Bag. Wait, no, I don't want to load. I'm going back to the main menu. Oh, really? Llama Computer has a... <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, I didn't know that. That's interesting. All right, so we are currently playing the Beagle Bag on the Apple II. Lots of different games to pick from. Uh, a few of these are kind of educational or math-style games. Like you can see, this one is Slippery Digits, and it's it's where you're hunting and finding different uh, numbers. The Name Game is another one we have to guess the name. And then Hang Person is another Hangman variant, which we've seen before. Uh, Gas Crunch is another one where it, it's just a number-crunching game. Uh, and I think oh, that's right. Gas Crunch is the NIM variant. And then Elevators, let me show you this one. They're all meant to be like very small mini games. All right, so you have to use four different elevators and you're supposed to deliver uh, or pick up passengers that can deliver the car loads. So the way it works is you just pick which elevator. And so there's a, there, there's some something to pick up there. And I would just pick number one, get the elevator to go and pick it up. And you're just supposed to send your elevators up to get the cargo and then come back down. So I need to use Q to get that there. So you picked one up. And it's almost like you're having to manage multiple at the same time. And then go back down. And then let's get number two to come up and pick one up and then go back down. If you look down at your keyboard, it, it makes sense because you're, you're controlling four different elevators at once. It's another elevator game. The last one we saw was the first game by Gary Kitchen. This is the second example of an elevator game ever, uh, way before Elevator Action comes out. So there you go, elevator. Let's go back to the menu. <laughs> yeah, it does, but it's not. Don't get your hopes up. And then we have date search, another one where you're trying to search for a certain date on a calendar. Big deal. And then this is the other one I want to show you, which is Wowzo. Wowzo is another interesting uh, mini game slash puzzler. Wowzo. 
So it builds a maze every time you play. It's a random maze. At least for me, it's been different every time. Player one is Chrono. Player two. Last person was Punk Rock in the chat. And then do we want to go hard or easy? Wait a second. Hard is one and easy is three. Uh, I've never seen that before. Let's go three. Easy. And then keywords you want to enter. Uh, let's go rock. Uh, let's do Atari. And we're just entering words to find. Uh, let's do smoke. Okay, so it picks that one, and then it's going to hide the letters around. Now, uh, the first person that goes, it's Chrono's turn. And so I'm going to pick the direction I want to go. And you can see I move myself around the maze. When I get to a barrier, I can choose what I want to do to the gate. So if I have the C gate, I don't want to do anything to it. Uh, just go down. Oh, I said which gate. You do have to pick uh, the C. And then the gate moves, and then my turn's done. And now Punk Rock Biker goes does their turn, which direction, and you can see since the gates have all changed, now Punk Rock Biker has to go down, which I believe is, are they doing Z? Yeah, there we go. <laughs> and then <laughs> he's saying, which gate do you want to do? We want to do U, it's going to switch U, and then all uh, gates next to it move. So it's a puzzle style game where we're supposed to be picking up the word smoke or the letters in smoke, and so you and a partner are hot, hot seating back and forth, moving yourself around the maze. An interesting idea. You get all this and more on the the, the beagle bag. <laughs> now I didn't want to load one. Uh, I want to go back to the. Oh, I hit enter. That's why. Yeah, it doesn't need enter. You just have to hit M and then it goes back. We'll break it. We're done with the beagle bag. So you, it does have other games. A lot of them are very simple mini games, fast games like Hangman. But uh, it's I would say still almost up to par with the games we've seen for compilations in Europe. Just cringeworthy. So I would give, of all the computer games you could play at the time, a compilation like this, uh, we've seen better ones done. I'm going to go three, three, and a half, uh, three stars. Perfectly for average for all the other games you could play at the time. <laughs> Alright, so after that, let's see what our next game is. Just hook it up to your TV. It's time to go to the arcade and play some Blueprint. This is one that I've played on the Atari VCS, but this is, I've never played in the arcade. So this will be my first time playing Blueprint. Let's take a look at the artwork for Blueprint. Oh yeah, very colorful. This is by Bally Midway. And I did see that in Japan, it was published by Jalico, but the development happened in the United States. So we're gonna say that the first release was North America for Blueprint. And this is the advertisement that they would have seen selling to the, the operators. The most constructive game ever planned. We got some crazy guy running after your girl. I'm guessing we're going to rescue the girl. Maybe? Oh, yes. Daisy Damsel. That's her name. Now, notice that the advertisement is really similar to Donkey Kong. They showed the characters that are in the game on the left side. It was circled up. Like, this is where we would have seen the brave carpenter. Way to go, Bally Midway. Our hero, JJ, follows the plans to build a machine as fast as he can. Because if the contraption is finished in time... Oh, gosh. It's rhyme. I don't want to read that one. You have Ollie Ogre, who's hot on the trail of the fair Daisy Damsel. Let's hope JJ won't fail. No! <laughs> it's in rhyme. So if you want to, maybe you could rap to it or something like that. So we have the advertisement, uh, the arcade cabinet here on the right side. And it's available in upright, cocktail, or mini. And we also have different characters. Sneaky Pete and Fuzzy Wuzzy. That's awesome. <laughs> That is very true. They gave you more games for your money, so it made you feel like you were getting more. And so the, the, the draw for compilations were really big in Europe. We're going to see a lot more that show up, and I'm not going to be playing every compilation. There's the example of the arcade cabinet. Two different examples. That's the real one scanned in. Nice. So cool. There's our arcade PCB. On the system itself, if we look at the control panel, we have the joystick down the middle. It's an eight-way joystick, and the only button we have is run. So that's all we get for the controls of Blueprint. But I do like eight-way joysticks. There's the advertisement flyer for Blueprint. And an actual Blueprint. Throw that in there. Why not? And we also have the manual for Blueprint. Let's see what the developers said Blueprint was all about. This manual was made September 82, but uh, the first time you could ever play it, uh, at least early sources I found, was June. Here we go. Pass to the table of contents. Tell us what the game's all about. Blueprint. One or two player game. 
three different modes. In two-player, the t players take turns, so alternate play. When uh, playing this game, you direct JJ through the maze he's in. This is done with a control stick. JJ searching for parts to build the ammo machine on the blueprint at the bottom of the screen, which will enable him to save his girl girlfriend from the ogre that's chasing her across the top of the screen. Why are you building something with a blueprint when you should just go rescue the, your, your girl? If ogres are chasing her, you got bigger problems than that. Each part of this ammo machine is contained in one of the houses in the maze. Two of the houses contain bombs. Also, any house that JJ has removed a part of the ammo machine will contain a bomb. So if you forget which house you go to, you're going to be sorry. They go into a house, come back with a part, and tow it to the place where the blueprint is. If you get a bomb, then you got to drop it in the bomb pit. Once the ammo machine is built, JJ pushes the start button for it to be located in the lower left-hand corner of the screen. And that's done. The ammo machine will start firing at the ogre against uh, Damsel Daisy, Daisy Damsel, I, I forget her name. And uh, the ogre had a name too. What was his name? But after you do that, then it moves on to the next one screen and then the skill level increases. Ogre roots go faster, bomb fuses are shorter and so forth. So if you do have monsters that come and chase you, then you can drop those in the bomb pit. And that was all the pretty much the manual had for t technicality wise. Uh, let's see what his name was, Ollie the Ogre. Okay, so we don't wanna get Ollie the Ogre against Damsel Daisy. This one was available again in Japan under Jalico and then North America under Bally Midway. So here we go. We're going to the arcades to play some blueprint developed by Xylic Electronics, published by Bally Midway. The beginning of June 1982. When you first step into the cabinet, this is what you would see and what it would look like. All the artwork, the arcade marquee, and oh my gosh, they have one of the crazy enemies down here in the bottom right side. <laughs> that's right I don't even want to call Tron a compilation Tron is more than that Tr Tron is all those games in one and uh, it, it's just it's just fantastic five stars here on Chronologically Gaming alright so I'm going to go ahead and zoom us in to get a better view of the play field we saw a little bit of the attract mode that's better alright let's put a coin in and play some blueprint <laughs> Nice. So at the top of the screen, oh, Ollie Ogre looks very different than he did in the advertisement. There's Damsel Daisy running away. And I think every time, is, is it timed? Or is Damsel Daisy just continue to run away from Ollie Ogre the whole time? I'm down here at the bottom of the screen, running over the blueprint. And uh, JJ is uh, supposed to pick up pieces of the blueprint and then bring them back down. And now every now and then when Ollie Ogre is chasing your girlfriend, he's dr he, he can drop pots down and they can explode. At the same time, we can also have monsters that'll show up, and if you uh, tag the monsters, then you can drop them in the bomb pit. As far as movement, though, and power-ups, there's not any. The only thing you have is the run button. Oh, and if you get hit by one of the pots, then boom. Poor JJ goes to heaven. <laughs> I've died so many times in video games. So many afterlifes. All right, so if you want to, you can run, but down at the bottom is your fast runtime meter. That red meter, when you hold the run button down, goes down. And when it runs out, that's it. It doesn't come back until you die and come back. All right, so let's get going. Let's check out this house. This one has a piece of the blueprint. And the, the, the nice touch is where you walk over is where the blueprint's going to be put in. And this one is another piece. Nice. We got to remember which houses we go to because if we pick a house we've already done... Oh, and we get hit, then we're down. The game already, though, screams polish with how well it plays. Got another piece, nice. We also have some non-stop music playing while we play the game. Or at least a little thumping beat in the background. <laughs> and we get to put our score in, nice. High score table in. Cool. Oh, this is actually... In, you can enter this in really well. Whoa, that was so easy. Of all the high score tables we put in, that was a that was a good one. Yeah, Belly Midway spent a lot of time making this one pretty nice. All right, let's put some more coins in. If you do a two-player game, it's just alternating play. Waiting for your buddy to die and then take over. too cool okay so they switched it up i think it's gonna be oh no it's the same piece it was last time usually that doesn't happen oh and it says better luck next time like that's supposed to help you out all right so let's pick up a piece put it there nice and then go to this one looks good not gonna use my run until i get a bomb let's go up to this house next 
get another piece of the blueprint. Dragging it behind you is a nice touch, and having to put it in the right spot is cool too. Go find the piece. Get it right there, looking good. Got our first bomb, run it to the bomb pit. Good, drop it down. Get our bucket. Looks like we got another one falling down. Turned into a monster. And that one you can just avoid. This one though, you gotta get rid of him. He can mess up your blueprint. So you can see I can just drag him over here to the bomb pit. Yeah. Now the monster pit. All right, so now we gotta go to the houses in the center. And that should be our last two pieces. Oh, nope, bomb, nope. Quick. Oof. <laughs> no, <laughs> I went in the wrong house on accident. There we go, now we'll go back to the top. Another one, wait, so where's the blueprint? Did I miss one of the houses on the right side? <laughs> oh man, hard luck player one, it's just not your day. <laughs> All right, so let's go over on this side. I don't think we did this house. There it is, that's another shoe. So we're missing one last piece to complete the blueprint. Nope, not good, go. Whoa. And we have to avoid that guy. No, nope, that's still the same one. So now I've lost track of the house I need to go in. And we've run out of run meter. And we blow up. <laughs> Put in your score, I'll just go for sake. I'll be CBA right now. We already got enough coins in, let's keep playing some Blueprint. I would consider this an excellent arcade game, considering the other ones out there. You can tell they spent a little bit of time making this really special. Okay, got another piece, good. This time, gotta remember which houses I went in. This essentially is taking the maze idea that we saw in um, Pac-Man, but um, instead of making it um, just wandering around or picking up dots in the maze, it adds something more. You have to go in each house. Okay, next piece, looking good. Got it down there. Let's go to the last house on the left side. Still looking good, no bombs yet. Okay, so let's try out this one. Very nice. Go to the next house right here. Oh, that was really, really, really generous. Okay, got another piece. Then we just have the last two homes there. That means one of them's gonna have the bomb. Let's see if we get the one without the bomb. No, I didn't want that house. <laughs> Make sure you go in the right one. No, we got the wrong one. So it's the left one that has the last piece. We got plenty of run on our meter. And it does look like the top of the screen where Ollie Ogre is chasing is timed. So if you take too long, go, go, go. And now we can fire off our machine. Yes. Yeah, there we go. Way too cumbersome, JJ. Why not just jump on a plane and go shoot or just get a gun and shoot her, right? You're, you're taking way too long. <laughs> I will say, your girlfriend it has great stamina. Alright, switched up the maze force, which is nice touch. The bombs are going to get more difficult. I'm going to save my run meter until I um, pick one up and need to dash it over really fast. We got another monster to drop in. The Monster Pit. This Saturday, Saturday, Saturday. It's the Monster Pit. Okay, and now we're looking good. Go to the top left house. All right, so of all the arcade games we've ever played, uh, Blueprint is very well done. I wouldn't call this the one of the best arcade games you could play at the time. There's um, uh, many more out there that are a little bit more, oh, that darn monster. <laughs> he jiffed me. There's many more out there in the golden age of arcade games that are a little more iconic, uh, play a little bit smoother, faster, or um, uh, have mechanics that are something that, um, that, that that works well for for the game. While this is introducing something uh, a little fresh, it's still a slower paced than some arcade games, and it does take a little bit of while to get used to. So when you first play this, you may not be 
familiar with what to do or how to play. Oh, get him! Get away from my blueprint. Oh, no! <laughs> Hard luck, player one. It's just not your day. Every day's our day. Here on Chronologically Gaming. And they added in this other uh, crazy-looking Muppet-type character. Alright, so I haven't been to those houses, but that's where he is. And I have no, no way to attack him. It's just wait for him to move and then give it a sh Oh, wait, no! Oh, he messed up the whole blueprint. I'd have it done if it weren't for you meddling kids. Let's put that one up there. Get this one right there. There we go. Oh my gosh! Okay, is that it? Did I do it all? Am I missing one? What? No, come here! That looks like the whole blueprint for me. Oh my gosh, so that time he caught, uh, the ogre caught up with our girlfriend and we died. How, how we died whenever she died, I, I don't understand that part. We're not supposed to psychologically break down these arcade games. I will say though, of all the arcade games you can play to this point, this is a, still a great arcade game. Lots of fun. I'm going to go four stars of all the arcade games you could play. And if you went to 1982, this would be a four out of five. I wouldn't go in the five star range because I don't consider this one of the best arcade games you could play of all the arcade games. But Blueprint's up there. All right, so after Blueprint, that's where we got to put our video game playing on pause this evening. If you could go back to 1982, how would you rate all these games on our five-star rating scale? That's it for today, and like I always say, if you don't like any of the games you've seen thus far, then get to a computer and make a better one. Hey everybody, thanks for checking out the channel and joining me on my quest to play every single video game in order of release. We'll be streaming live every weekday at 9 p.m. Central, so join us and let us know if we missed any games along the way. This video would not be possible without LaunchBox, RetroArch, and MAME. Tell all your friends there's some crazy guy named Chronologically Gaming trying to play every single video game. We have links down below that'll send you to places like our Discord and Patreon, and one that says all the video games we've ever played. If you go there, it's a list of everything, and you can click right to the game you want to see. Chronologically Gaming is the name to look for. We are Perpetually Retro, and we will catch you next time.